right. I'm ready for the word. Anybody ready? Good. I'm glad. And I'm going to bring it in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, we're going to bring it. All right. um, I want you to turn with me. Let's go to Luke chapter 1 because we're starting with the month of December. We're starting our Christmas series this month. But I don't want you to check out because a lot of times... (laughs) People begin to say, I know the Christmas story. So they begin to check out. No, this story is prophetic and it's for right now. Are you listening to me? It's for right now. God says, I have a word for you today. And and, and the title of my message is the time is now. The time is now. Some of you have been saying, when God, when. But I'm here to prophesy to you. God says the time is now. You've been in a season of waiting. You've been in barrenness. You've been waiting. But God says the time is now. See, somebody, if you get that in the womb of your spirit, you would be shouting a whole lot right now. Because I receive it right now. The time is now. The door is opening. The prayers are coming forth. Every deposit that you made in the womb of my spirit, I say the time is now in Jesus' name. Now, let me put this in a lot of uh, in context for you before we start reading the word. Uh, the last ministry, now I love ta- starting out in Luke chapter 1 because it's amazing to me how God begins to move. Because if you understand and you read the Bible, you will see that God did the miraculous. He parted waters. He he did different things for the land of Israel. And and you can see the context of his miracle working power. But there were long periods where nothing happened. See, some of you today, you've been in a long period where nothing's happened. You've been in a season where it looked like nothing was shifting, nothing was changing, no doors were opening, but you just keep doing the right thing. You keep on praying. You keep on, I hope you keep on praying and you keep on standing and you keep on being faithful. But see, that's where the blessing comes. When you keep doing the right thing, I'll never forget. When I was, I started traveling and ministering when I was 12 years old. And I'll never forget a a minister that was older, that was uh, very godly. He spoke to me. He said, Andrew, the greatest lesson that you'll ever learn is for you to do what's right when no one's looking. It's easy to do what's right when everybody's looking at you. And you're like, of course, you know, I'm on the platform. I'm going to do what's right. Hallelujah. Trust God. But when you're in the middle and nobody is there around you, and it would be a lot easier for you to dip in a little compromise here. It would be easy for you to settle a little bit over there. Come on, I'm going to get in. I'm going to step on some toes this morning. It's okay. Just just hang with me. Uh, it would be easy for you to give in to depression over here. It would be easy for you to hang out with that person that draws you astray. It would be easier for you to uh, dismiss all the checks of the Holy Spirit that he's saying, I'm checking you on this. Don't go that way. Don't hang out with that person. Don't go around the... Come, I know I'm getting in some business this morning because some of you have been saying, I want to call that person. I feel lonely at the holidays. You better put that phone down. They're not worth missing the plan of God for your life. They're not worth missing and getting into compromise. God says, I have something greater for you. But who are you when no one else is looking? Are you still doing what's right? Are you still standing for God? He said it's great when you're standing on a platform or when you're in church and you're lifting up your hands and everybody's amen and with you to join in. But what about in that midnight hour when you feel so alone and it would be so much easier for you to pick up a substance? I told you it's going to be rough. We're going to get it. You say, what does this have to do with the Christmas story? We're getting there. We're getting there. I promise. Just give me a moment. Just give me a moment. Because somebody's going to be set free this morning. Somebody's going to be encouraged because God says, well, I saw when you did what is right. I saw the seed that you sowed. I saw how you stood when it would have been easier. And all your friends are saying, it doesn't take all that. And why are you going to that ramp church? What, what's the name? The, what kind of church is that? They don't even have a denomination behind their name. And the pastor wears ripped blue jeans. Yeah, 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 we do. 
Yeah, we're a little bit radical, and that's all right. Come on, we're going to get a little bit more radical. We're going to get a little bit more radical. Why? Because we're in pursuit after him. It's not about religion. It's not about a game. It's not about a name on a sign. It's about the what God wants to do on the earth today. And listen, we're not better than anybody else, and we're not less than anybody else. We are called for such a time as this. But... It had been years that nothing had happened. I'm talking about hundreds of years. We saw God do mighty things in the book of Exodus when he brought God's people out. Then we saw God do mighty things through Elijah and Elisha and the prophets. We saw miracles. We saw resurrections. We saw things begin to happen. But then we went through a period in the Bible, went through a period, the people of God, where it seemed as if God was silent. What do you do, Cindy, when God seems silent? You keep seeking. You keep crying out. You keep believing. You keep doing what is right. You keep on standing. Because guess what? It's going to come around where God begins to answer. And this period had been hundreds of years. Now, let me just read this because it's easier for me to, to read this. Uh, the last ministry of miracles would have been during the time of Elijah and Elisha. That was 800 years before the time of our text of the New Testament that we're going to today. There had not been an appearance of an angel that we know of for at least 500 years. And you thought you were waiting a long time. We, we thought we were waiting a long time for the promise to manifest. God, please don't let it be 500 years. And God hasn't spoken that we know of again in at least 400 years. Suddenly, something begins to shift. Suddenly, things begin to change. And I'm declaring this morning that there is a suddenly being released in this season there is a suddenly some of you have had weeping nights I hear the Lord saying you've been through seasons where it has been overwhelming overwhelmingly it has been just mourning and and I hear the Lord saying even some of you are dreading the Christmas season because it it reminds you of loneliness it reminds you of hurt. It reminds you of things. See, we, those of us that have families, and different, we can't forget that some people have lost people. Some people are incredibly lonely. Some people are going through some storms. So in all of our merrymaking and our holiday traditions and, and everything that we got to remember those that are hurting as well. That's why we're uh, doing an outreach for the forgotten child. That's why we're doing an outreach for the military that we're sowing seed and we're going to receive another offering after the service so we can bless our military, those that are serving our country. But we can't forget those that maybe don't have that tree and have that uh, life goal and maybe don't have their children or their parents with them anymore we've got to be uh fill in that gap but see this time in this text we see that there god had been silent and it seemed like god's people had been forgotten i want to ask you have you ever felt forgotten can we be real this morning have you ever felt like god did you for i love you but i think you forgot about me here I am. <laughs> There's been many times I've been praying, God, I'm right here. He says, I have not forgotten you. I have not left you. I have not abandoned you. I know exactly where you are. And one of my favorite scriptures, this, I'll get to the text, but one of my favorite scriptures is in Genesis, in Genesis 1-8, where it says, and the Lord, and God remembered Noah. And the Lord remembered Noah. You say, why is that one of your favorite scriptures? Because sometimes when you're on the ark and you're in the middle of stink, two, at least two of every animal, can you imagine? And you think, God, is it over? Where are you? I'm, I'm still stuck on this ark. But then it says, and the Lord remembered Noah. It didn't mean God, it doesn't mean God forgot about him. It means he moved towards him through his covenant promise. It means that he remembered his promise to him. And he says, and the Lord remembered Noah. That's one of my favorite scriptures. Anyway, I just had to throw that in there. 
But uh, there's been many times that I've said, Lord, do you remember me? Do you, do you remember the prayers that I've prayed? Do you remember that I'm sitting here? I feel like I'm on the ark of isolation. I feel like I'm in a place that, that's really kind of stinky. I don't really like where I'm at right now. I, I really don't like going through what I'm going through. But do you remember me? And I'm here to tell you this morning, God says he remembers you. Hallelujah. In fact, this series, I've titled it, Get Ready for an Explosion of Miracles. The explosion of the miraculous. Because out of nowhere, God is about to answer your prayer. Prayers are being answered. Hallelujah. Let's go to Luke chapter 1, verse 5. And it says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah. Now, I love that that the Bible just downplays it and says he's a certain priest because there were many priests. He wasn't the high priest. He wasn't the one that, that was the main guy. He was just a certain priest named Zechariah of the course of Abiah. And his wife was the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord blameless. And they had no child. Now, I want you to notice that. They walked blameless before the Lord, but they ha had no child. Because that Elizabeth was barren, and they were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. So let's stop right there at verse 9 because I want to teach you for just a moment. So we understand that lots were drawn. What were lots? Lots were like pick a straw. I mean, that's the only way I know how to describe it. Uh, but they would draw lots, and the one that the lot would come upon would be the one that was honored to be able to do the service unto the Lord. Now, it's important to understand here that there were uh, so many priests that this would only happen once in a lifetime. Are you with me? So uh, Zechariah wasn't going in to uh, do the work of the Lord in the, pre in, the, in the temple of the Lord in this holy place. He wasn't doing it, you know, every week like we come into the house of God every week. And, and I know exactly where my mic is. I know, you know, pretty much where, where the sound's going to be and how the I, No, this was something he'd never been in there before. He had never seen this before, and it was a great honor. See, I think in today's society, sometimes we degrade the house of God, like, oh, I might go to church. I'm going to, I'm going to do the Lord a favor this morning, and I'm going to show up. Really? That's, okay, Let, let's go. that's my pastor's sermon for today. Let's get back to the word, back to Zechariah. And so he drew this lot, and finally it was his time. This is my time. I've been waiting for this my whole life. I've been training for this my whole life. And now I've drawn the lot. I'm going into the, the house of God. I'm going into the place of God. I'm sure he was excited. And it says, verse 10 says, And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at that time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Now, the reason that Luke, the historian, describes this as such, because he wanted you to understand there's different types of visions. There's visions that you have that you will see like in your spirit or, or, or you'll see. But there's also visions that are like the manifestation, like that person is standing in front of you. Okay, you all with me? I'm not trying to get too deep and lose you right here, but, but it's important to understand that he's describing he was on the right side of the altar because he was there. It means this wasn't something he saw in his spirit. This wasn't something that, that he dreamed or a, a vision. No, this was a visitation. He said he saw him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And then it says, and when Zachariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. Now, you have to understand. Let me just break this down. 
So this one time in his entire life, he's been serving all these years, and this is the time of his life. This is the time of his, uh, I mean, this is just what he's been called to do. A lifetime opportunity. And he finally draws the lot. And so he goes in and with fear and trembling. Because where the altar of incense was, was the, the farthest you could go without going into the Holy of Holies. Are you hearing me? And you know the Holy of Holies, only the high priest could go in one time of year with a rope tied around his ankle because if there was sin in his life, he would drop dead in the presence of the Lord. And they had to have a way of pulling him out. So this was very significant. This wasn't a lackadaisical, you know, throwing the presence of God around. No, this was the holy place. And this was the highest ranking place you could go unless you were the high priest. And so this is his opportunity. Now, I was reading this this week, and I began to get uh, uh, just amazed at, you know, he's probably thinking, I'm coming in to my assignment. I'm finally fulfilling what God has called me to do. And now I'm walking in to this holy. Right there is the holy of holies. Right there is the presence of God. Right. Oh, that's the, that's the place of the high priest. Now you have to understand. He's never seen this place before. So I can imagine him kind of looking around for the altar of incense. You know, where, where am I supposed to put this? Oh, there it is. You know, it's made of gold. They told me it would be made of gold. And they, they told me. And then he looks to the right. And there stands an angel. And it says that when he sees him, he says that he was troubled. Now that word troubled means with great fear. It doesn't mean he was like... Hmm, puzzled. It means that it's the same word that was used to describe when they fell prostrate before the Lord or they fell like a dead man before the Lord. So it was not just that they were like, hmm. No, he was like fearful of what was taking place. He probably, I can imagine, I just like to, 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 to humanize these people because I'm thinking, he's probably thinking, did I do something wrong? Is God going to take my life? Is, it, it, did I walk in here unholy? God, I tried to prepare my whole life for this moment. Did I do something wrong? You know. So he stands there and there's an angel. Now let's look at it together. In verse 13 it says, and fear fell upon him, verse 12. Verse 13 says, but the angel said unto him, fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom and the, of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah, as said unto the angel, whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. Now I want to stop there at verse 19. Let's break some of this down. Say, I'm still awake. I'm ready. So he says to Zechariah in verse 13 but the angel said unto him fear not Zechariah for thy prayer is heard now when you study that out in the original Greek let me just read it to you properly let me read it to you properly here because it says for thy prayer was heard the Greek implies that this is a long-standing petition so he says your long-standing prayer 
has been heard. So what you've been praying for, for a long time. Now it doesn't say he was in the middle of praying for that at that very moment. I'm sure he had given up in that moment. See, I've come with a word for somebody to tell you those that have given up on some forgotten prayers, prayers that you prayed long ago, prayers that you thought were never coming to pass, prayers that you thought God had forgotten about. Get ready. He's about to answer those prayers. Get ready. God is about to move he said I have not forgotten your prayers but your prayers your petitions have been heard and it says that he says to him whereby shall I know this now that's some boldness of Zacharias because if you're in the altar of incense right next to the holy of holies priests are dropping dead if they're not holy And then you're going to say to the angel, whereby shall I know this? Well, an angel standing before you, dude. I mean, I'm just like, really? Wherefore shall I know this? Whereby shall I know this? And, And he says, then this is where he really makes his mistake. He begins to declare and speak against the promise of God. See, you've got to be careful with your mouth. I know we all have to be careful with our mouth because it will bring judgment. We will have the fruit of our lips. Come on, somebody. And it says that he says, whereby shall I know this? And he's, then he goes on to say, for I'm an old man and my wife is well stricken of years. She's old too. How's this going to happen? I don't see how the miracle is going to come through my life. I don't understand how God is going to answer my prayer. Am I talking to anybody today? I don't see how God is going to use me. I don't see how God is going to bring revival to Chattanooga. I don't see how God is going to raise up a people in the midst of Brainerd Road that have the fire of the Holy Ghost where they see the lost saved and the sick healed and the captive delivered. I don't see how that can be. It's been too long. It's been, they're too old. How in the world is God going to do this? And the angel, I think, got a little ticked off. I think Gabriel got a little ticked off. Because when you ever, you begin to question what God has decreed to you, I think it ticks off heaven. I think heaven's like, do you not know who your God is? You're going to sit here from earth and say God's word's not going to come to pass. Don't you know when he speaks it is? When he said, let there be light, there was light. I'm going to give you scripture to back it up in just a second. Are y'all ready? And it says, the angel answering, verse 19, answering said unto him, I am Gabriel. See, that's, I love that name. It means messenger of God. That's why my son's name Gabriel. Whereby, my name is Gabriel. And I stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not be able to speak until the day these things shall be performed. Because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. He said, I came with a message from God. Don't you understand? I stand in the presence of the Almighty. And I came with a message for you. And it's good tidings. But because you begin to say and disqualify yourself by saying, I'm too old and my wife's too old how is this gonna be he said in fact I'm gonna have to take away your voice so you don't speak against what I have declared he said you're gonna be dumb you're not gonna be able to speak because I've come from the throne room and he said God Almighty has said this and they will be performed in their season They'll be fulfilled in their season. See, somebody's season's coming to, to, to pass. Somebody's season. See, this season is not just a season we put up Christmas trees and Christmas lights, and it's not about Santa Claus. I'm not going to get up here and, and, and preach.
preach against Santa Claus. My kids do something, but they know that Santa Claus bows his knee to the name of Jesus. That it's about Jesus' birthday. It's about him coming to earth as a man and dying on the cross and paying the price for our sins. It's not about a man coming down the chimney. It's about Jesus who gave his life, who came in a manger and was born of a virgin. Come on, somebody. He said, but thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. I believe today I've come to announce somebody's coming into their season of fulfilled words. Somebody's coming into their season where they're going to see the promises of God fulfilled. And verse 21 says, and the people waited for Zechariah and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus saith the Lord, dealt with me, dealt with me in the days wherein he uh, wherein he looked on me and take away my reproach among men. Now I want to stop right there for just a moment and I want to give you a little more teaching. I want to talk to you about what he was doing in the holy place. The altar of incense is very significant because it was golden, it was an altar, it, it stood outside the veil, like I said. Uh, from the Holy of Holies. It was the, uh, the holiest place you could get to without going to the Holy of Holies. And it was there that he would put coals upon the altar and smoke would come from the, the coals that were represented the prayers of the people. So we need to understand what he was doing when God sent a messenger, an angel, to say your, your petitions, your prayer have been heard. He was there. It wasn't by coincidence. It wasn't by happenstance. It was by divine appointment that his lot was chosen that day to go to the altar of incense and put coals for the people of God on the altar. And then the smoke began to go up before God that represented the prayers of his saints. But not only his people, but represented Zechariah and Elizabeth as people as well. And that's when he looked and he saw the angel as he was doing his priestly duty. See, I hear the Lord saying, and even as I was reading this this week, he said, Andrew, when you get serious about my house... I will get serious about your house. I know I just stepped on some toes right there, but it's okay. That's what we're here for. See, we're not here to just make you feel good and send you home. I'm here to help you and equip you and to train you for the work of the ministry. It doesn't say the pastor is the work of the ministry or, or the evangelist. No, it says the fivefold are here to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That means when you go to Walmart, you need to be a minister. That means when you go to your job, you better be an apostle or a prophet. God's going to give you a word in due season. Come on, somebody. But I believe out of this house, God is raising up fivefold ministry gifts. I believe that there will be some of you that are, are in full-time ministry. I believe that God is calling some of you in that, that area. But we are all called to ministry. Get that. Please hear that. Because what happens is people put that responsibility solely on the person with the microphone. And then the person with the microphone begins to burn out because we have all these people depending on that one person to hear God's voice. And that's Old Testament uh, theology. That's not what the New Testament is. The New Testament is the veil has been torn from top to bottom so that whosoever will could come into the presence of God. That means you can pick up your Bible and you can hear from God yourself. That means God can speak and give you a dream or give you a vision today that will blow everything I've said out of the water come on God says I want to use you but this is so significant because when he begins to do service for the other people see that's why we're going to give this Christmas because when we do service for other people guess what God gets serious about our house I love that and I want you to notice something a couple of more points and then I'll be finished. A couple of more points. Are you all ready? Say, I'm ready. ready. 
I want you to notice that it says, after this, he could not speak. He comes out, and the people are expecting him, and he's having to motion to them because he can't speak. So they perceive that he's had a vision. I wonder what the motions were. I'm not making light. I just wonder. I, I think crazy things like that. When I'm reading the Bible, I think, I wonder what the motions were that he's that he gave. But anyway, somehow he communicated to them that he had seen a vision or that he had an encounter in that. They didn't know exactly what it was. But the angel said, you're going to be dumb. And some of us, some of us, we've got to quit speaking against what God has promised us. We've got to quit uh, uh, speaking doubt over what God has promised us. I'll never forget when God spoke to me one day and he said, shut up. Now, some of you are getting offended because it wasn't King James. I guess thou shut up would be better. (laughs) Thou shuttest thy mouth. Yes. Uh, uh, But he speaks Andrew to me. And so he said, shut up. And I was saying, but God, I want to tell you about how this person hurt me and how that I may never get up from this attack. And, and, and I want to cry and, and just have a pity party. I'm telling you, I got really into it, really into it. It wasn't like one of those, they hurt me. It was like, God, I'm never getting up from this. Like I was the first person, the only person that's ever been hurt in the world. But, but this was a bad situation. But I'll never forget, he said, shut up and get up. The enemy does not know how effective his attack against you was unless you tell him. He only knows how you react to an attack. You get up, put on your armor, and open your mouth and begin to praise, and you will confuse your enemy, and he will think his scheme did not work. So I did not feel it. If you're waiting for a feeling, you're missing it. I did not feel it. In fact, I felt opposite. And I even told the Lord, you know. I didn't tell him because I didn't want the devil to hear. But I was saying, you know. In other words, I was saying, you know I don't feel this right now. But I'm doing it because you told me to do it. And I'm doing it because I believe you are who you say you are. And you're a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. I believe that you're still the God that turns what Satan means for my evil and turns it for my good. So I, you know God. I may not be feeling this, but I don't walk by feeling. I walk by faith and not by sight. So I don't walk by how I feel. So God, I'm putting my praise on because you told me to. So I say, God, you're the God of all gods. There is none beside you. God, I thank you that the enemy's going to wish he'd have never done this to me. He's going to wish that he'd have never wounded me because now I'm going to pour the healing that you poured into me and I'm going to pour it into everyone I meet. He's going to wish he would have I'm coming out with a new fire. I'm coming out with a new anointing. I'm coming out with a new prayer life. I'm coming out with a new praise in my mouth. I'm coming out with a new zeal. I'm coming out with a new revelation. See, some of you need to understand that God is turning for you what the Satan has meant for your evil. He's turning what Satan meant for your destruction. And you're coming out with boldness. You're coming out with fire. But I loved, and I've never as many times as I've preached on this message, I've never seen this before or noticed it before. But in verse, uh, let's skip on down. In verse uh, uh, 24, it's, or 23, it says, And it came to pass that as soon as the days of ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. Now, he has this encounter with an angel, Gabriel. He cannot speak. And he's told they're going to have a baby. Many theologians believe that they were around between 70 and 90 years old. That's young for some of you in Jesus' name. God renews our youth. Hallelujah. I say that scripture a lot. God renews my youth. Um, Anyway, let's get him back to Zechariah and Elizabeth. And you have this encounter with God. My first thing I would 
today's world, my first thing I'd be doing is texting my wife, you won't believe what just happened to me in the holy place. But in that day and age, I think I would probably be very tempted to want to run home and say, you won't believe, you're about to get pregnant. No, no, I, I saw an angel. But I couldn't talk. So I would say, I don't know how he kept it to himself. I really don't know how he kept But he was focused on what God had called him to do. Because when you begin to focus on what God has called you to do, you know that God will take care of everything else. You know that God will, I'm going to say that again, God will take care of everything else. When you seek first the kingdom of God, all the other things, see I love how the writer puts it, all the other things, they'll be added unto you. Like it's no big deal. A new job, all those things will be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God. Uh, A spouse, all those other things will be added unto you. Uh, Finance, all those other things will be added. Come on, some of y'all need to leave this place saying, oh, all those other things? I'm just going to seek the kingdom of God. All those things will be added unto me. That's nothing to God. But it says, after the days of his ministration means he kept doing what God had assigned him to do. That's why you can't afford to give up. Are you hearing me? You can't afford to give up because you are closer to your miracle and your breakthrough than you have ever been in your life. Some of you say, well, I haven't heard God say anything in a long time. Get ready because we are in a season of the miraculous and we are going to see an explosion of the miraculous in Jesus name. And he says they finished his ministration. And I love this. Let's see. In verse 24, it says, and after those days, after those days of service to the Lord, his wife, Elizabeth, conceived. She got pregnant. Come on. Against all odds, they were barren. That means they had tried. They had believed. They had prayed. Remember, it means constantly praying in the Greek. Your constant petition, your constant prayer, something you had forgotten about. See, I believe that Zachariah and Elizabeth had probably let it go and and settled for, we're never going to have a baby. It's just not going to happen for us, even though they deeply desired it. How many times do the, does the enemy try to make us settle for less than what God has promised? See, I remember after my wife and I had, had several miscarriages and, and the doctor said it would be very difficult for her to carry a baby to term. Uh, you know, there came a point, and it was right after the last time, I remember saying, we're not going to use this money to go back to the doctors to try something else. We're going to go on a trip. And the doctor said, it'll be six months before you can, uh, you know, it it, it could possibly even happen. It was six weeks later, and we found out we were pregnant with Juliana. And so I recommend going to the Bahamas. (laughs) Yes, if you need a travel agent, she's into that now. Uh, uh, But... Y'all didn't know Juliana was bohemian? (laughs) But I'm getting silly. Back to my answer to prayer. But, uh, uh, you know, we determined, you know, this may not. Honestly, I remember telling the Lord, I have promises about my children. I have words that you have spoken over them. And God, if that's not going to happen, I'm okay. Come on, have you ever been to that place where it's like, God, I still love you. Even if that doesn't, I still love you. I'm I'm still going to serve you. I still believe you are who you say you are, and I'm okay. But God said, I didn't call you to be okay. I didn't call you to try to make excuses for me or excuse me. He said, I will do exceedingly abundantly above all that you're able to ask or even think. So why are you thinking that your problem is okay for me to bypass? 
God said, no, you're not going to be bypassed. This is prophetic to somebody in this room today. He says, you're not going to be bypassed. I'm going to fulfill my word. Don't you settle for what less than what I promised you. Don't you settle for, okay, God, this will never happen for me. No, they said it probably will never happen. But when you study this out in the Greek and in the Aramaic, it means that the angel stood and said that petition that you made. See, I believe God sent me with a word for somebody this morning to say that prayer that you long forgotten about that prayer that you said it's okay if it never happens I'm still going to serve God the prayer that has escaped your mind and it hurts too bad to even pray it anymore God said I heard that petition and I'm bringing you into a season of the miraculous where you're going to see that petition answered and you're going to see me do what only I can do you thought I forgot but I heard your prayer heard it I heard the cry of your heart and he said you may have forgotten but I didn't forget and then Zachariah says but I'm old my wife is well stricken whenever I preach this word I say that just doesn't sound good stricken I'm going to stricken you with sickness sir come on she was well stricken that means she was really stricken honey you're not well stricken don't get don't get don't cry God renews her youth too but it just sounds bad and so Zechariah begins to argue with the angel in the holy place he's picking a fight Pastor Josh with with an angel I don't think I would want to fight Gabriel I really don't. So, Gabriel, if you come, I'm going to agree with whatever you say. And he's saying, but I'm old and my wife's old. And he says, I sit in the presence, I stand in the presence of God, the one who created everything. When he speaks a word, See, he gets defensive about God. It's time for us to make a stand for God. You don't understand. When he speaks, it's not maybe. It just happens. And because you question it, you're going to be dumb. You're not going to be able to speak. Because your words have come against what God has promised. See, I believe that in the hour in which we're living It's time for us to partner with heaven and not fight heaven. Not fight what God declares and what God decrees and what God says. Some of you have been trying to argue, well, God, I don't see how it can happen this way. God's going to bless me in business. How? I don't see how. I'm on a nine to five job. I don't see any prospect. God's going to use me in ministry. I don't see how. I don't have one open door. I remember telling God one time, God, I had more doors open for me when I was 12 years old. And that's the truth. I used to travel and sing in different camp meetings and and, and different seminars. And then it was like I became an adult and everything dried up in one season. And God said, I have you here because I'm doing a work in you. But I remember telling the Lord one day, God, I had more doors open when I was 12 years old. He said, quit speaking that. See, sometimes we can curse our future by the words that come out of our mouth. I believe God is saying today, silence your mouth. Don't you dare speak against what I have decreed and what I have declared and what I have promised you. Because what God says, he will do. Not one word, I'm going to say it again, not one word will return to him void. But it will accomplish whereunto it has been sent. And the Bible tells us, that he was made silent, but then he did the work of the ministry. And then he went home, and when he went home, Elizabeth conceived a child and became pregnant. Now, I think it's significant to understand that after she conceived, she hid herself for five months, saying, Thus saith the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me 
and take away my reproach among men. Now, what does that mean? In that day and hour, that age, uh, that season, that time of life, if you did not have a baby, it was a reproach. See, we didn't, they didn't live in a day where women wanted to kill babies and men wanted to kill babies. They lived in a day where it was a blessing. If you, that was a sign of the favor of God on your life if you had a baby. And, and so when you didn't have a baby, ask Sarah and Abraham. See, this is as miraculous of a conception and birth as Abraham and Sarah. They were all old, yet they all conceived through a promise but sometimes you have to hide what God has. Because you start getting around somebody that's saying, well, I don't believe that. Oh, poor little Liz thinks she's pregnant. She's just getting fat. She says, I'm eating for two. No, she's eating for her belly. You know that those people, some people would think that. You see an 80 or 90 year old saying, I'm having a baby. You're not Sarah. You're just, a, he's just a certain priest. He's not even a high priest. But the word says that she hid herself. In another word, she protected what was conceived in her. See, I'm telling you, you can't get around everybody and let people begin to speak death over what you're carrying. Let somebody begin to speak doubt over what God has promised you. That's why you've got to guard it. That's why you've got to say, no, I, I can't share my vision with everybody because there's going to be some haters that begin to tell you why God can't do it and God's not going to do that for you. And I never saw God do that before. Well, guess what? Maybe he starts with you. Maybe he wants to do something impossible through you. I, I, I don't know who I came for, but I believe you've been sent by the hand of God because I prayed you in this room so that you would hear the word of the Lord. When you get that thing, you've got to protect it with all your being. You can't let the enemy kill what God has put inside of you. Because there's a spirit of an assassin that wants to kill the word of God in you. You don't believe me? Just open your eyes because there is an assassin, a spirit of assassins that want to kill the dream. That's why they wanted to kill Joseph's dream, but I'm telling you, they could not kill it. I, Y'all, y'all, me and Gabriel have been having devotion, so we might go all over the Bible today, but I know I don't have time. I feel it, though. We read about Daniel this week. We read about Joseph this week. It was, it was power. I was having church in, in his room. Hallelujah. But you've got to guard that thing, Maggie. You can't let people begin to speak death over what God has promised. You've got to guard that thing. You can't let people begin to speak over what God has decreed over your life. That's why you can't say, uh, uh, oh, please believe in my dream. See, I, I, I can't go. I'm not going to go around with people. Please believe in what God's called me to do in Chattanooga. I'm just going to keep doing what God's called me to do. And I'm going to say, you know what? God has called me for such a time as this. We will see revival. We will see awakening. We will see a movement of God. We will see what God has promised. I don't want to hear all the naysayers. I've heard all the naysayers. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Uh, just keep your complaints to yourself because I'm going to be busy at the altar birthing what God has promised. I'm going to be at the altar birthing in the presence of God see that's what Nehemiah don't come off the wall you keep staying on the wall you know I had I'm about to close but I had some people that were that decided they were going to leave the church and 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 we bless them but uh they wanted to meet with me and give me a list of the reasons while they were leaving I said it's okay I love you I bless you I, I don't need to take time and, and, and you give me a list of, you know, I didn't smile at you the right, right way or whatever it was. Because I've, I'm, on the, I'm on the wall. I've got to keep building. I've got a people that are, I've got a city that's depending on me. I've got a nation that's depending on me. If we ever need missionaries in America, it's today. We, we, I don't have time to get in pettiness and try to defend myself and try to fight. I, I just don't have time. I bless you. I love you. God bless you. You're dismissed. I'm building. I'm not coming down for 
and that's not that I don't love people or if they're, somebody's dealing with the issue, please hear me. That I'm not going to, I'm saying I'm building, I don't have time for you. No, I'm not saying that. Don't take it out of context. But what I am saying is I'm not going into pettiness. I'm not going into uh, uh, 21 reasons that you don't like the way I preach. Or, or if, if it's not for you, it's not for everybody. I get it. You know, I'm not everybody's flavor. That's fine. But you know what? I am for the ones that, have called, that are called to me. I am for the ones that my voice unlocks what God has put inside of them. I, I, I know one thing. God may have not called me for everybody, but I do know I'm called for some people. And some people are desperate for what God's done inside of me. And I will never stop doing what God has called me to do. So if that's your motive, sorry you lost. Because I'm telling you, I'm going to keep building. But Zechariah and Elizabeth finally conceived, and she hid for five months until she got, I believe, until she got into the safety zone. Because I remember when, when Brooke and I finally got uh, pregnant with Juliana, we didn't go tell everybody, hey, we made that mistake once. And then we had to get up in church and tell everybody, hey, we lost. And that was the, one of the hardest things that we ever had to do is we lost the baby. And then everybody feels sorry for you. And one thing is, I'm not a victim. I, I, you know what, we go through things, we, we have situations, but you know what, I hate it. One of the things I despise most is if somebody is feeling sorry for me. I've been through too much, and I'm too much of an overcomer for anybody to pity me. Don't, don't think I'm always going to be where I am. Don't think I'll always be in that low place because I know my God and I know I, you may be feeling sorry for me today, but guess what, honey? Tomorrow I'm going to be an overcomer and tomorrow I'm going to possess the thing. Come on. Some of you need to understand you are not a victim. You're an overcomer by the blood of the lamb, by the word of your testimony. Too many of us are walking around with victim mentality instead of overcoming mentality. You say, where is this Christmas message going? That was a little side message for you. We're rising up to be victors. But the word he gave me for today, and I'm closing. Musicians, you can come on. I heard him say to tell you that the prayers that you thought God did not answer or you thought God had forgotten about, he said, I want you to tell them, Andrew, I heard your prayers. I heard your petitions. Now get ready for the answer. Get ready for the manifestation of what God has spoken. Get ready to see it in your life this morning. Get ready. He says to you today, I heard those cries and I'm answering your prayers. Now this morning you may have felt forgotten. I believe many of you walked in this room with a smile on your face. But in your heart you felt like maybe God forgot. It's okay God. He said I don't need your excuses. I'm God. I can do the impossible. I have heard your prayers and although it looks ridiculous oh, I hear the Holy Spirit say even though it looks ridiculous it looked ridiculous for a 70 or 90 year old to get pregnant he said I'm about to move in a ridiculous way for my people 